guys, Rob from Georgia here with you, aka VHS82 Apostrophe, with my ongoing Italy's Holocaust series with episode 16, Alien 2, Solitaire, or on Earth, uh, as many probably know it as, um, 1980 film, a uh, Italy's direct answer to Sir Ridley Scott's masterpiece of science fiction horror, Alien. Uh, marketed as an extension of that film and really does, unlike, say, Contamination, um, really does attemptively, I, it feels, to extend this story uh, with this uh, you, this sense that uh, if you want to play it, I guess, if the derelict craft was truly on its way to Earth to drop off, off his payload, um, you know, sort of that idea of extending that storyline to, well, let's see what would happen if this alien entity, whatever this payload was, this biological warfare, whatever this thing was, let's play it out on Earth. Uh, and Alien 2 is pretty masterful in terms of its low-budget fare, and uh, it is... Uh, I say masterful when you really do consider the film. I love this film, man. I love the score. I love the effects. Uh, it is in, it is low budget. Uh, and it's funny because uh, in the trivia, Mario Baba was asked by Ciro Apollato, uh to consider directing it. But Mario apparently had another project he was working on and passed on it. But the poetic justice, uh, or, you know, I guess if that's a way to say it, um, it would have been funny because... If you think about Planet of the Vampires under Mario Baba, ultimately we can make an argument that it leads down the road to Ridley's Alien, which I believe stands on the shoulders of Planet of Vampires. Um, it would have been pretty funny to see Mario then jump over that and do the pseudo sequel. Um, you have to wonder about the story and the layout, how would it have gone? Uh, would Mario really been in the business of trying to basically imitate something that was standing on his own shoulders. But this is Sierra's, uh, this is Sierra's movie. And uh, through and through, the DeAngelis uh, brothers bring the score. Of course, they're known for Torso, Slave of the Cannibal God, Killer Fish, uh, The Last Shark, A Blade in the Dark. I mean, their, their filmography uh, in terms of their scores is just long ranging and it, this this score is awesome but there's a this basically what you have here in alien 2 um it, it is an alien ripoff true 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 but uh you what you have here is uh you have a uh a space mission that is uh returning to earth and the movie opens up with a lot of stock footage in order to give us the sort of opening you know vibe of where we are headed uh, and uh, when the um, capsule lands uh, lands in the ocean, uh, seemingly there's no astronauts to be found. But some sort of alien life form, something, has traveled back with the capsule. Uh, no explanation. Uh, none to be given about a lot of things. That way. You, you just got to... This is just this is pure storytelling. And you just got to not... You got to just go with the flow with it. Um and once this thing hits Earth, man, uh, it starts immediately to uh, have its impact. Now, you have a group of kids, uh, well, really young adults, um, probably in their 20s or whatever. If not, yeah, they're probably in their mid-20s or whatever. Uh, led by um, Thelma and Roy. Uh, Thelma, uh, played by uh, Belinda Main. She would actually go on to be in Crawl, uh, which is interesting. Um, but the film, once it leaves its stock footage sort of set up uh you open up with roy and thelma thelma's on her way to uh they're um spelunking their cave uh their cave jumpers or or they repel down into caves and explore caves and she is going on this guy show to talk about this in the midst of that interview she suddenly has this vision uh this sort of apocalyptic doom and gloom vision that something absolutely horrific is coming well this sort of abruptly ends the interview her and roy leave they catch up with her friends, and they're planning on hitting this one cave. Now, I have to say, the uh, the filming takes place in the uh, Castel Castel ah, Castellana, the caves of Castellana, outside Rome, I believe, um, which is really a fascinating place to shoot a film. Uh, you don't have to worry about building sets or any of that. They just went in live, and they, they, 
they went down into the uh, the main entrance way, and uh, they somehow well, a lot of other movies have been filmed there, I, I guess. Um, but the, the the backdrop to the aspect of the film that takes place underneath the earth uh, in this cave system is absolutely stunning. It is absolutely beautiful um, to behold. In fact, the main entrance way I do believe they go into is known as the La Grave or the Abyss. And the idea to think that these group of, of young, I don't know, these group of kids, let's just call them kids, are about to go down into the grave and basically deal with this alien presence who Bert, uh, one of the uh, one of our uh, characters, uh, unwillingly, said, when they're at a, uh, they're at a uh, sort of an outdoor cafe or, or at a, some sort of off the road cafe, that's where they generally, um, they change at places like this uh, and then they, you know, get to their destination. Uh, he sees this pulsating weird, I'm not sure if it's actually pulsating at this point, but this blue rock, uh, and you know, get no explanation of how these things are just all over the place. But he sees one, thinks it's cool, takes it with him, not knowing that this is the alien uh, thing that has come back on our our vessel that has been out in space, right? So once they go and they descend down into the cave, then the rest of most of our story involves uh, them being pit against uh, this this alien entity that just starts wrecking havoc on them which becomes a metaphor for everything happening above which we never see and you're not going to see because that would just be way 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 too high budget but you can imagine what's happening above ground by everything happening below ground and so you see how these characters are dealing with this uh this alien thing and of course belinda or i'm sorry well yeah belinda plays thelma Thelma starts to piece things together, uh, sort of, you know, on pace in terms of, you know, maybe it has to do with uh, the missing astronauts, maybe it has to do with this, this, that, whatever. And ultimately, her and Roy, which, which uh, is uh, Daniel from Anthropophagus, which is so funny, you wouldn't recognize him because of his longer hair and his beard and everything. Um, this is truly an 80s movie, man. Um, they're uh they are they are the last to uh flee from the cave system everyone else is just mutated destroyed just left you know in their bloody pulp mess which i have to say the special effects are freaking awesome the, you have this one maybe it's it's the it's the replic well I, I say it right replicated chest burster scene it's its own answer to it and you got this long dolly shot of the camera that slowly from the feet of the girl that has been seemingly attacked by this alien um she seems and looks fine as the camera pans slowly, slowly. And this is a long, in a good way, painful shot. <laughs> but by the time you finally get to her face, it starts to pulsate. And then, man, springing from her face, which sort of is a prelude to some of the things Ridley will do later on, uh, say in uh, Alien Covenant, right? With the, the back burster scene and just becoming more imaginative with how that is doesn't have to necessarily come out of the chest cavity uh and this thing just erupts man out of her head man and it is that leads into another special effect sequence where the poor guy has had it attached to his neck and as he's hanging it upside down from one of the caverns uh, up higher his head literally slowly just starts to fall away from the body and then just falls uh so i mean there are some neat now the alien practical itself of course low budget uh, they don't have a lot to work with, and so how they uh, how they approach it is pretty imaginative, actually, um, for what little you have to work with. But what really lies under the surface, uh, pun intended, I guess, is the imaginatively thinking what has happened by the time you do get back above ground. They basically find a, a depopulated world, man. There's like no one in sight. Uh, they find this abandoned cop car. And they eventually are retracing the steps uh, that you initially follow with them in the beginning of the film. You retrace those same steps <laughs> back to a bowling alley that they had originally met up with their friends in at the beginning of the film. Um, there is a, uh, a confrontation with an alien uh, entity there, which I think that's the point where Roy finally bites it. And um, I always forget her name. 
Thelma. Uh, she eventually, into our final conclusion of the film, uh, goes down into Midtown now. They must have gone out there early in the morning on a Sunday morning with no permits, of course, in hand. And somehow they got a brilliant shot, this apocalyptic sort of emptiness vibe shot with her wandering it through the streets and finally falling down on her on her knees knowing that she probably she could be the very the last one who knows if there's any survivors to this but you get this overall apocalyptic sense which i find this movie so brilliant um in that you're able to convey this imaginative message of what is happening by simply exposing you to what is happening to a small group who are uh, cave explorers. And of course you shoot it in the Castella, Castellana uh, caves, which are uh, just an absolutely beautiful place to film a movie, uh, quite the spectacle actually. Um, and, and you just sort of, you go on this adventure with these poor unsuspecting kids, just call them kids, they're probably in their twenties or whatever, but and everything that they're exposed to and have to deal with is a metaphor for or is symbolic of what is happening above in the cities in all the populated areas. And you can only imagine how nasty. But isn't this how, you know, we often imagine what would it have been like if the derelict craft was a coming to Earth and did drop its payload? What would that have looked like? That would have been nightmarish of a scenario. You know, New York City just an explosion of those uh, alien chest bursters and then going, I, I mean, it's it just nightmarish. And so Apolito manages to to sort of take that thought process we we, we would have had as, as a kid, say, and take it to its next logical step by at least giving us a type of visual to what it would have been, right? Obviously, I mean, nothing compared to if you pump millions upon millions upon millions and we're able to somehow pull it off i'm not sure exactly how you could pull off something like that um but it, it does, it's pretty successful now i have to say too 20th century fox did apparently try to sue because they used the word alien in their title uh and they lost the suit <laughs> because there was a book the judge uh the judge realized there was a, a book uh, called alien in the 1930s so as a result of that either everyone's going to have to go back to that source or as a result of that source salt the lawsuit now neil marshall apparently would try to sue um no i'm sorry apolado or his people would try to sue neil marshall it was neil marshall who did the dissent because they felt like he was copying them which is so funny you know you would think nearly getting sued by 20th century fox you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> do that kind of thing because uh, they escaped without having to pay anything. So interesting, right? Um, so anyways, I didn't even show it, I don't think. This is, uh, this is the 88 films uh, release of Alien 2. One of the great additions on this, of course, is, uh, is an interview with Eli Roth, who speaks uh, you know, to this. It's a love letter to this film, which is really awesome. To I've watched it a bunch of times. Uh, I think there's a trailer or two. Other than that, no real extras. Now, the... Um, uh, the only release this ever got in America, I'm, I can't imagine, I, I can't remember what, who it was now that did it, but the, I'm pretty sure that's out of print, or if it's not out of print, it's like 40 bucks, but this 88 films, if you're region free, you can get the Blu-ray for like 16, 17 bucks, or you can get the DVD uh, for only like, I want to say 11 or 12 bucks, something like that, uh, so th you can still grab this uh, if you're region free, or pay way too much money, it's not worth $40, but I mean, 10, 12 bucks if you're region free and you can still get the 88 films release and enjoy Eli Ross interview, uh, giving a little love letter to uh, this film. Um, and uh, I guess one last thing, Apoletto, uh, he did direct, he did write, and he is credited on the special effects. Um, so uh, to you, Apoletto, that was uh, pretty impressive what you pulled off. Um, so really, I guess that's all I'll say on this. Um, it's, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a fun trip, man, if you love Italian, and especially the Italian response to certain American films and how they would be marketed, this being a direct, pseudo-direct sequel to Alien, right? Um, but, you know, it is, hey, it's fun, good Italian stuff. We'll end here. 
as always, appreciate it. Thank you. We always end these things off with Go Bills.